You have one precious life. How will you make your money work for you? It's time for Sage Money Conversations, where your financial happiness and confidence are always the subject. Here's your host, certified financial planner, Barbara Norman. Welcome to Sage Money Conversations. I'm your host, Barbara Norman, and today we have with us Vladen Trifunik. So Vladen has been in the insurance industry for almost 40 years, so he has earned every single one of those gray hairs. Um, Vladen, I'm not far behind you, but I hide mine better. <laughs> What I love about Vladen is he spent 24 of those years as an independent insurance adjuster. And in working with Vladen with my own insurance, the big aha moment was I never realized that the way I talk to my claims adjuster can affect how my claim gets paid. So Vladen, you know, welcome. Is it okay if I tell my story about my car accident? Sure, go ahead. So how Vladen are you was, today, Barbara? Vladen was great. I actually was pulling into a parking spot. I was backing in and got hit from behind. And Vladen's initial reaction was, well, you were rear-ended. It's not your problem. But then when I got with the claims adjuster and he knew that I was moving backwards, it wasn't that way. And the biggest mis- I was actually faulted for that accident. And so the biggest mistake that I made was I had, didn't listen to Vladen's words as he was trying to help me get prepared to talk to that adjuster. And bless your heart, he did get it fixed, but it was kind of some awful moments, some really emotional moments in there. So Vladen, coach us through, if someone is going to make an, an, a, a claim, what's the process here? Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Um, you know, it's hard when we have a claim. It's a traumatic incident. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're... You're shook up more often than not. You might have been in a hurry to get to an appointment. It might have made you late. There's so many things that work into it. And the biggest challenge for me as a as an agent, and I saw the mistakes when I was adjusting claims. The biggest problem as an agent is seeing how people are at the moment of the impact, and then they mm-hmm. carry that emotion with them when they talk a claims adjuster. You do need to make a claim. You, that's why you buy insurance for. It. Sure. But I always encourage people to step back a little bit. Take a breath. If you're safe, if the car is drivable, first thing is always you document everything. Photograph with smartphones now. There's no reason that you shouldn't have pictures of the car, the location, maybe even the other party if they're not going to if they're not going to be resisting to it. Because it, it's good to have the familiarity of, of in reminder of what it was. But when you make a claim, it's critical to be very succinct. Take the emotion out of it. Okay. The sun was in my eyes is really not a relevant. Point of, of the loss. What exactly happened? Uh, in your case, in particular, things happen so fast mm-hmm. that what we did with yours, I don't know if you remember or not, but we took an aerial of the location of where you were and we showed that the car said that you hit, hit them actually backed into you while they're going into a private driveway. And they ducked in as you were still moving into your parking spot. So Luckily, that other party was very honest with it. It's just that the adjuster couldn't put two and two together without knowing what the location looked like. So when we're able to show them. Yeah. So who does that? Here you are, my agent, and I love you for it. um, Taking these aerial views and actually reenacting the accident, right? And coaching us through the, the right words. Like that was a paradigm shift for me. I've never seen an agent do that before. So yeah, that was huge because it got me out of being responsible for that accident. And so, yeah, it's not that we're trying to be dishonest. No, no, you know, absolutely not. I mean, the whole process is to be as detailed and authentic and honest about what happened as possible. The adjusters are very astute. And unlike what many people think, claims reps are looking for ways to settle the, the claim mm. the fast as possible and to pay out who needs to get paid. I I know that's usually not the common thought, but I've been around claims representatives and inside adjusters and enough that I know that 99% of them, yeah, you get the odd one out. They look for reasons to pay. And semantics plays a huge role on how they can determine it because Mm -hmm. they can only respond to what we as, as victims of an accident tell them. So having that clear communication and using all the tools that that are available to us, Google Maps has been fantastic for me, for my office. All my team members are trained. You know, if there's an accident that's in any kind of dispute, that there's even a hint of a possibility that our insured was not at fault and they're being blamed for it, we'll take an aerial photograph, we'll superimpose where everybody was, give flow of traffic as best as we can, and we send that on up to the claims representative. 
So when they're talking to my customer, they're able to visualize what my customer went through. So it helps them negate that emotion that might be coming through that might be clouding their perspective of how that accident really took place. I love that. And it's so important. Oh, yeah. So that's cars. We can do an aerial view of a car. But now let's say we have a loss in our home. And I think yeah. probably one of the scariest things are these firestorms, right? We're just yeah. coming at the end of another fire season. They're getting longer. Yeah. Um, aerial views of what's in your house don't work. So now let's talk about fires or or claims for your home. How to Give us some tips there. Sure. And again, semantics is everything. And one of the, the things that I always reference is the word flood. So it's not fire that we're talking about, but that's okay. When we deal with water damage, it's water damage. So yeah. claims are up here as flood. They might be thinking Katrina. You know, that's a flood. So getting a claims rep on the same page to understand where you're at, that's very important. The big thing that we always want to make make sure people are aware of, you know, insurance is there. And if you've done your job with your adjuster or a bigger partner with your agent and you work together to get a good valuation for your home as far as insurance value. Mm-hmm. If there is a fire, there's very little that that will not be covered. Okay. So that's at good. that point, get yourself to safety. That's I mean, I'm forever shocked when I hear people stay behind to fight for their homes. I appreciate the hard work and and the blood, sweat, and tears that went into building that that home and being able to buy it. My hope is that if the insurance agent has done their job properly as well as the consumer participating, they've been able to come to a conclusion over what the real value of that home is. And when it is a catastrophic loss, this people are shocked when I say this, the catastrophic losses are much easier to settle than partial losses. Sure. You have policy limits and an adjuster shows up and some of these horrific fires that we've seen in Northern California over the last several years, a chimney is left behind. Right? It's pretty, yeah, that policy is pretty easy to determine how much can be paid out. The challenge comes in when it's a partial loss. And this is where I encourage people to really consider the language. And what I mean by that is my TV got burned. Well, there's probably about 250 different TV <laughs> models just in Costco alone on a good weekend. Right. So <laughs> this is where I really tell people, you have the opportunity with video cameras, uh, telephones, to go around and identify the products throughout your house, Mm. not for the insurance company's sake. They're never going to ask for it. Well, I shouldn't say never. 99% of the time, they won't. However, you need to remember that you're not just insured for the TV and the furniture. You're insured for your toothpicks. You're insured for the broom that's in your garage. You're insured for the linens towels, things that we accumulate year after year and maybe don't get rid of as often, but can amount to thousands of dollars of value that we're entitled to as consumers. And the adjuster wants to pay you. They just need help. What was it that was lost? So when there is a fire- Open up the cabinets and take pictures of everything, every plate, every spice, every (laughs) holiday decoration, uh, jewelry- Absolutely. And and I don't know if you've done your podcast yet on your book on your methods of having all documents, the information, which is amazing. I haven't done the family binder yet, but we'll we'll get that in there. So yeah, it is an amazing book. So the family binder that you do is probably the I've never seen it before with anybody else. I think it's spectacular. And that is the perfect place to put a flash drive Uh, of all your personal belongings. Just you know towels, pantry, what's in the under, I know it sounds terrible, what's underneath the sink? Well, you have all those items are covered and part of your loss. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So let's look at my policy because I think there's areas where I think even in my own situation, my mom is elderly and they're talking about, hey, you know, mom can move in. She's in a split level house. Mom can move in downstairs. We can you know, someone else can live in the house, take care of mom. Like what if they, what if they're ambulating my mom and they fall and get hurt or they hurt both of them, they hurt their back. Like what does my policy cover in a situation like that? You know, and and that is really, especially as our society ages, that is such a valid question and pertinent and every homeowner's policy is different. So there's some that automatically include workman's compensation coverage. Mm -hmm. There's others that it's an added endorsement. Uh, yet others that will say, well, 
if they work X amount of hours, they have to be full-time employees or whatever the circumstances are. So policy language and understanding that the value of that policy and what it can do for somebody that is a in-home caregiver is just invaluable and super critical that that is established prior to getting that person to work mm-hmm. with you. Okay. Um, the first thing you have to identify is, is that company, is it, are they hired through a company? You know, yeah. does that company provide coverage? Let's say they're not. It's just someone I brought in off of Craigslist or the church or care.com. Sure. Yeah. And th- that's the circumstance you have. That's where your policy has to be really in your back pocket, if you will. You have mm-hmm. to know where the coverage is for that. Your agent has to be aware that there's somebody else participating in the care of the family member so that they know in case there is a situation, they know that that call might come in and that they can be right on it and direct that to the right party within the claims department and know that there's not going to be a gap in coverage, if you will. I know. And that's a huge area because like you said, it's an aging population. We have a lot of people who are doing creative things, but not knowing whether insurance covers it or not. And that's like an extreme situation where we've got someone in there eight, 10, 12 hours a day or full time. Or what about on the other side of the scale where maybe I have someone come in to mow my lawn or clean my house and they get hurt or my dog bites them. Now, how does the coverage work? Yeah. So California is one of these states that offers what they call strict liability. In other words, you're pretty much on the hook for it no matter what. One is rear end collisions and the other one is dog bites. Oh. So unless there's some extremely extenuating circumstances, both those cases will go up to the insurance and insurance will more likely than not settle that claim for you. Okay. Um, and that's why it's imperative to know, again, your policy limits. Where are you with the coverage? And you know, do you have a small dog that's less likely to leave a a mark. Do you have a shepherd of Great Dane where if they bite somebody, it could be catastrophic. And and I don't know if we have time, but I have a tragic story that that could have been more tragic, but the circumstance with the dog bite that never leave me. But but gardeners, people that come into work, most people that you hire will have their own insurance. They'll be self-employed until you give them your products. So keep in mind that loaning out your things might expose you to liability if something is an ill repair, giving someone a ladder that's wobbly and they fall and hurt themselves. That can open your, you up to a claim. And being open to a claim doesn't mean that it's going to get paid out. It just means that your insurance company is going to have to defend what happened. And that is liability that we all take for granted. We want to help our neighbors who want to do things. And that's all well and good. Continue to do that. Yeah. But let's make sure what we give them is safe and in operable conditions. So let me get this straight. So the person who comes and cleans my house, if she brings her own mops and brooms, I'm not liable. But if she's using my mops and brooms, I could be liable? Possibly. I mean, it'd have to be pretty, pretty bad mop and broom that you got there. But yeah. Ladder. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, but you know, theoretically, you know, it, it could be. I mean, There's so many different circumstances under which claims will step in. And every company is different. Every policy will have different language. But that is a a situation where we see things happen. Yeah. I think another area where I get really curious is Airbnbs or those ADUs in the back. So um, if I do put something in my back, do I have to buy extra coverage for that? If I make them buy their own coverage, am I clear? Talk to me about those. Airbnbs, ADUs, how do those work these days? Well, in San, in San Diego, especially, that's become a, a big topic because mm-hmm. now we're allowing mother-in-law units where zoning might not have allowed that in the past. Now they're being allowed. A couple of things that you have to look at that. First, you want to make sure whatever you have back there is built properly by a professional. You want to make sure that it's ADA compliant. This allows egress and without anybody tripping, falling, uh, allows everybody to have full access to it. So having it done right is your first step. Okay. Notifying your insurance company that you're doing it is absolutely your second step. You have to be able to feel comfortable with your carrier protecting you when you're making income on a property. A lot of people don't realize that if you have a separate detached structure in your home. So think of the old days, the garages. Mm -hmm. So all throughout Southern San Diego, we have homes built with detached garages. Those garages are included as part of the homeowner's insurance. 
Okay. It's, a, it's a separate line item. It's called detached structures. However, if that is being rented out to somebody, like let's say for an art studio, it no longer becomes an insurable product oh. through your standard homeowner's policy. Okay, wow. Because, and again, that's most cases. I think I, I don't think there's too many companies that would not have that. That's pretty much the pattern that I've seen throughout my career with insurance. So having a detached mother-in-law unit in the back, you're now profiting from that space. It's one mm-hmm. thing to have a she shack. What is it? She shed? She shed. Yeah. <laughs> it's one Man thing to have a, in the she shed. <laughs> there you go. It's one thing to have that in the backyard where you're just enjoying it. That is covered to a limit uh-huh. with part of your homeowner's insurance. But the minute you start making money on it, you now have a, a business operation and that no longer will be covered. Oh, wow. So if they go in and party hard and do some damage and I don't cover it. It's on me. Very likely. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have a hard time getting that through a claims department. And that's why, again, you know how you rent it using Airbnb, using Verbo, any of those companies will have their own liability coverage as well. And it's critical to, critical to know what they will cover. And people will often say that the percentage you have to pay to those companies is too much. And there's issues that go on there. It's a separate topic, of course. But part of that pays for that million dollars of liability that they're carrying so oh. if there is a gap between your homeowner's coverage, you have a potential of collecting from Airbnb or from Verbo. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm listening to you and it brings up kind of some other issues of knowing what our policies cover. Like right now, when I look not just in San Diego, but across the US, if not across the globe, like housing prices have just gone sky high in the last year. Does my policy cover, like at one point it covered to rebuild at $1 amount, now at another dollar amount. And I know you and I have had discussions too in the past where now if there's a a supply shortage, that the supply chain is messed up and things cost more and they take longer. Like, how does that work with my policy? Yeah, that's another one of those circumstances that we're certainly experiencing right now in San Diego, probably everywhere in the country. I know from our directly in California, it's been pretty horrific with the fires and the shortage of lumber. So when your home value is established, when you first buy your home insurance, you're insuring the structure. So want to make sure I'm clear, land is never insured. Mm-hmm. So it's always a structure. So regardless of the sale price of that home, and we've seen it back in 07, 08, people were bought, paying a million dollars for teardowns because there's just this commodity. And then they weren't able to insure them for more than three to four hundred thousand dollars. So you had this gap. Yeah. But that was just how those days were. Then things changed a little bit. And for a while they were insuring people were buying homes cheaper than we were insuring them for because we could not rebuild at that value. Mm-hmm. The reality that a lot of people forget is evaluating your home for insurance value is really the responsibility of the homeowner. And that's sometimes difficult to process, but you know your home better than anybody else. Sure. You know when you're going to remodel at any given time. You know all the upgrades, all the nooks and crannies, the little details. And the agent can only do what you tell them. They can only input the data that you give them. So having that and having that done on a routine basis, I recommend at least every two years going through with your agent, reevaluating the homes, you know, condition, if you will, has it been remodeled? Has anything been upgraded? New roof, new plumbing, new heating, all those things can actually give you a discount. The oh, newer the okay. The newer the plumbing, the newer the furnace, the newer the electrical, the newer the roof, all those may add up to actually what a, a more desirable and favorable rating by the insurance carrier. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. And and it's also critical to know then where the market is construction wise, because if you were, well, if you bought a home two years ago and you just went through the shortage that we're going through in January, chances are you're going to be underinsured. Is it going to be long term? Is it going to be just the blip on the radar until the supply chain comes back to where it normally is? Maybe, but you want to make sure that you're prepared for that. And there's different elements of the policy that, that help there as well. So do insurance companies automatically adjust for that? Like, will they adjust my um, homeowner's policy up just to compensate for the shortage and then adjust it down when this gets fixed later, if it gets fixed? I mean, is is that priced into the insurance or is that up to the insured to do that? It's a little bit of both. And in my company's circumstance, our policies have a 
cost of in, uh, cost of inflation rider that mm-hmm. are optional. In my office, we make it standard. Every every home policy that we sell, we include that in there. And historically, that will go to three to four percent. But if you have an overly active market, a supply chain issue, you need to make sure that what that adjustment looks like for you directly. Because okay. if the cost of living was already adjusted, and now the shortage hits, for example, let's say cost of living was adjusted in, in March, mm-hmm. but now you have a supply chain issue in June and it might be a long term. It might be a year, year and a half. This pandemic certainly do- doesn't help. The different uh, other factors that the fires, all that causes a supply chain issue in the building industry. You may need to increase that coverage for a few more years over and above what the standard cost of living index might have they had in place already. Sounds like it's a joint responsibility, but kind of what I'm hearing is it's just good peace of mind to pick up the phone once in a while and make sure we're good. Absolutely. And if you see a lot of activities that would, again, I'll go up to Northern California because the familiarity of it. But when you see these fires come into areas year after year, Mm -hmm. as a consumer, that demand for those materials are going to be much more aggressive than just general development. And that isn't planned for. So you should be very cognizant of of the fact that whatever's happening, even though it's not in your backyard necessarily, is mm-hmm. going to affect you one way or the other, and you should be prepared for it. You should talk to your agent, find out what steps can be taken to mitigate any potential shortfall on a rebuild should those fires come in your area. Got it. I like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We also talked a lot too about claims. What happens when an insurance company doesn't renew a person? You're in a high fire area, you've had too many claims. What happens to a person when they can't renew? Yeah, uh, we're seeing a lot of that right now. And again, I'll, I think the fires in Northern California have given the industry as a whole a little bit of a, of a shakeup. Mm-hmm. Um, San Diego uh, has been no stranger to fires in the past. We've been blessed with with very minimal ones in the last seven or eight years. But that can change in a, in a blink of an eye. And a lot of carriers are recognizing now that some of the territories that were safe and that were okay, they're pulling out of them rather than risk having some catastrophic losses come through. Sure. As an agent, I understand it. I understand where the the numbers and how it works. As a consumer, it really chaps my hide. Um, <laughs> I, I would love there for there to be some easy mechanism where we can establish a way to assure that we'll have options as co- consumers, more than mm-hmm. one or two companies. Until that day is done, we only have one or two options. If you are non-renewed as a consumer, you have to go into the secondary market, if you will. And these are usually companies are called non-admitted carriers. They're quality insurance companies, but they don't necessarily have a presence in California. They're allowed to operate in the state of California, but they're not obligated to operate under the guidelines of the state insurance commissioners. Mm -hmm. So they can charge premiums as they want. And it's kind of buyer beware. Again, it's not that these companies are bad. Most of these companies are very, very good companies. They're usually sold through the brokerage system, not through a dedicated agent. And they have a little bit more flexibility on what they can underwrite, but it comes at a steep, steep price. And if right now there's parts of San Diego County that even those companies won't touch. So the last option and the very last resort is the California Fair Plan. And the FAIR plan is designed to protect your structure. Okay. That's pretty much it. It Not does have pro- it has a little bit of protection for contents. There's limits to how much it can go. So for example, your maximum coverage in the FAIR plan, contents and structure included, may not exceed, and, and forgive me, I don't know the exact number right now. I want to say it's $2.5 million. Uh-huh. So that's not hard to achieve when you're in, in parts of San Diego that we that we're familiar with, sure. where areas that you can insure, but people might have a ranch, for example, or mm-hmm. a farm. And by the time you put in all the outbuildings, the all the equipment that's there, it exceeds that in the blink of an eye, you're out of two point five million dollars. Wow. So there, it, it's designed to focus on the structure and get a, you know, a roof over your head again. So you, if you have to make compromises, that's where you make compromise. What they don't absolutely do not cover is liability insurance. So if you're that family that Mm. can't insure the house, but you have a dog, you now have, or even a pool, you no longer have liability insurance. So you have to go yet to another company 
to ensure reliability. So you're, you're carrying two different insurance policies. And in some cases, you may also go to have to go to another company to insure against water damage. Wow. So it's very restrictive, much pricier. So homeowners do have some choices, but at a very steep price. So, wow. So if, let's say I live out in the hills of Escondido and my insurance company cancels me, is there any kind of recourse I have? Can I go back to that insurance company and appeal? It depends. So most companies don't leave a neighborhood. They leave a territory, a zip okay. code, for example. So there's two ways that they can non-renew those areas. One will be they will not write any new business. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the, com- that used to be historically with a lot of the bigger companies, they would go into an area and they'd realize the risk is too high. They have too many homes insured there mm-hmm. and they will stop writing new business in that area. So they just don't want to grow. The trend now that we're seeing is that many of the, uh, the companies are just out and out saying, not only do we not want to grow, but we're non-renewing everybody in the, in this zip code. So that limits your ability to appeal. If it's a claim related non-renewal, mm-hmm. there's so many things you can do. You know, a okay. proactive customer can, you know, present their case to an adjuster. The longer you, the longer you've been with the company, maybe the better it's been. But you know, your agent should sit down with you and what are the options? Can you maybe take on a higher deductible? Can you, in some cases, some insurance company might allow you to exclude that risk. So, hey, insure everything, forget the water damage, exclude that for me, and I'll be okay with it. Just don't cancel me. A lot of people will ask, well, why is it worth that? It's not fair. I should be able to make a claim if I have a homeowner's. You absolutely should. You have to understand, too, that there's no regulation with insurance carriers. They can non-renew with just giving people ample notice. Unlike car insurance, where Mm -hmm. it has to be a cause and effect, on homeowners, it's strictly voluntary uh, service. So homeowners insurance homeowners carriers do not have to look at you and say, well, you've had three claims, we're going to get out of here. You can have a claim with $0 paid out, and it counts against your record, just like a claim might be for $100,000 paid out. I'm not kidding. Yeah, a claim is a claim. So once you call in for homeowners, if you're uncertain, if it if it's coverable, if your deductible is maybe $10,000, so you have a $5,000 deductible, talk to your agent first. Make sure you have an estimate. Make sure you know the scope of damage. Because if you call that 800 number and they take the claim, they take the report and you find out that, oh gosh, you know, I have a $5,000 deductible, but eh, the damage is only $4,000. Let's forget it. No, that claim's in your record. And oh. if a new buyer wants to buy the house, they're going to see you had a claim on your record. Wow. Wow. This is really interesting. Yeah. Homeowners is, has, is a world all its own. Let me ask you about another area. And it kind of, I think it goes to the issue, especially now in COVID, we've all got these packages being delivered and they take pictures yeah. and it's like, nope, we delivered it this day, this time. There's a picture of it on your doorstep. Oh, yeah or even like cybersecurity. I recently had, um, this is a sad situation. They thought they were buying a gorgeous rug from India. And what showed up was a package with a torn piece of ribbon in it. Well, there was a tracking number that said something got delivered, but there was nothing in it. And so talk to me about like cybersecurity issues. Somebody gets hold of my credit card. I can't get this thing with the bank fixed. That happened to my mom or a package that was not delivered with what it was supposed to have in it. How does homeowners help us there? So homeowners can help you with cybersecurity. Most every company offers a an optional packet. There might be a baseline coverage, $1,000, $10,000. And then they'll have some additional coverage that, that you can buy over and above that. I also strongly encourage people to make sure that they look at their credit cards. The credit cards have protections that are really far reaching. And a lot of people forget about that. Uh, Many people forget that a credit card can cover you for your deductible if you have a loss when you rent a car. Uh So certain, so when you're traveling, certain car uh, credit cards will back up your your insurance so that you don't pay anything. Same thing will be true for uh, for fraud. So depending on the credit card, they may have other cybersecurity protections. And really, if you're shopping online, 
use the method that gives you the best amount of protection. Uh, not the most so, points, but the best amount of protection. <laughs> under those circumstances, yeah, it's either that or the ribbon in the box, right? Right. Um, because insurance will not cover that. Sadly, wow. insurance will not cover things that you bought online until you take possession and have something physically yours. You pick mm-hmm. up that iPhone, it's yours. Until that happens, the theft of that iPhone is not your iPhone. So even and, if there's a picture on my door, uh, that package on my door, and I came home from work and it's not there. That's such a new process. I would hesitate to say that they wouldn't be covered, mm-hmm. but it would definitely be one of those that years past, uh, products in transit were not covered. Now that people are wising up and providing video evidence of a yeah. delivery, there's a case there. I would argue as a consumer that there would be a case there that says it's mine. It's on my property. I have possession. And now you also have to look at what your deductible is too. So yeah. again, that being stolen, if you have a higher deductible, uh, if you have renter's insurance, chances are you have a very low deductible, and then you might have a chance to make a claim. But as a homeowner, it's depending on what it was that was purchased, it might be a little bit different. But I think there's a constant theme running through this. It's to pick up and make your agent your new best friend and talk to them about what's going on in your house, what you're doing with cleaning, mowing, mom, dad. There's so many moving parts here that, and I'm going to kind of caution our, our audience. I mean, shop the relationship, don't shop the premium because what's cheap in the beginning, uh, and I hear it from you and I hear it from so many people, what's cheap in the beginning never ends up being cost effective in the end, especially when, you know, if I'm looking online, I can't talk to the computer about what's going on in my life or my home. A claim on an 800 number that I bought insurance through, who's going to guide me? Am I hearing you correctly? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that a consumer can always be the their own best advocate. Mm-hmm. It's nice though, to have someone in your corner. It's yeah. nice to know that the agent that you've established a relationship with is going to be able to pick up the phone and help you a little bit. If nothing, you should be able to be trust them enough, look them in the eye and know, is this someone that you can trust? Is this someone that they might give you an answer that you just don't want to hear? Yeah. But are you okay? Because you know them enough to know that they wouldn't steer you wrong. And it's like anything else, right? It's, we we're you know, we go to dentists that don't hurt us when they do our teeth cleaning. We stop it with the state attorneys that we know are going to guide us and protect generations down the road. If you don't have a foundational basis with your insurance, all that other stuff is kind of on shaky ground. You know, the, the money that you've earned so hard, you worked so hard to earn and save simple claim, you know, the dog bite issue. That's really the big thing. And, and, and I, if I can share this story real quick, about four years ago, I get a phone call from an agent from Missouri mm-hmm. and he's chatting, chatting up and he says, after all the pleasantries, he says, I'm sorry, we have to meet this way. I said, what way is that? Well, my niece was renting a place at your insureds, and she's the one that got bit by the dog. Oh, wow. And that The person he was referencing had called me two days before and said, if I get a dog, how much insurance should I buy? <laughs> and I said, well, we started talking and went over some details. And it turned out that she had two Great Danes. Mm-hmm. and. And $40 a year more was the max she wanted to spend on the budget. Never mentioned that the dog bit this girl. Oh, no. The agent sent me a picture of his niece, 23-year-old girl. She had so many stitches on her face that the doctors, the only way that the adjuster could process the claim was going through the medical report to count how many sutures were put in her face. Mm. Now, this is a a, a individual that put a shed in the back of her yard, went to Home Depot, bought a a large shed, had it insulated and converted as a bedroom and was renting it as an Airbnb and allowed that person to share the kitchen and the bathroom inside her home. The dog's bitter. When I called, Mm. when I called her after I was informed, she said, well, I didn't think it was, she had her own insurance. I didn't think it was a big deal. I will tell you that didn't go well. And you can only imagine how that. And all it took was a conversation before this is what I'm doing. This is what it was. Because if not for the fact that Airbnb stepped in, she would have lost her home. 
She oh did not gosh. have enough insurance when this happened. And the whole process was so traumatic. But you can imagine a 23-year-old, God, God forbid anybody, but a anybody. You know, 23-year-old young lady. Yeah. So not this being able to talk to your agent. On so many levels. Oh, my gosh. Oh, it's, it's a tragedy. And you know, having an agent that you can trust, and I, and I feel bad because I think I might, might not have done a good enough job to tell her that she could talk to us ahead of time to let us know what might be happening. Whatever reason, she felt that she couldn't. But you shouldn't be that way. You should be able to call your agent be direct with them. It's your property. It's everything there is that you're going to risk if they don't know what's going on. And usually the difference in premium is so insignificant that what you save at the end during a loss, you'll be so grateful that you had it. It's huge. And you know, you're know, you making me think of one more area of insurance that I didn't think, and that's an umbrella policy. Um, right. So often I talk to my clients and I'm adamant about you get that umbrella policy. It's the cheapest thing you can do. Um, but I find people without umbrella policies. To explain to us what an umbrella policy is and how it works. So here's how I describe the umbrella policy. And maybe it's not the best. If you can imagine a house built with bricks and the foundation is your house, the bricks of the car and all that good stuff. Umbrella is the mortar that fits between there. Okay. The it holds everything together in the sense that what may not be covered under the auto policy, and really when we think of that, it's excess liability. We train ourselves to think a fender bender. Yeah. We never want to think hitting that pedestrian, but it happens. What's enough coverage for sending someone to the hospital? And there, there usually is never enough. No, if it's in a the, CEO in a Tesla, I think that's an issue. <laughs> you know, one of those examples that another agent that I don't want to take credit for, it, I, I forget his name, but another agent I sat and spoke to one time uh, shared a story with a surgeon that had his arm out the window of his car, you know, kind of like driving like this. Uh-huh. And a big truck drove by and the mirror shattered his elbow. Oh. So this was a, a surgeon that was now incapable of performing surgery. Mm -hmm. He had severe enough damage that they didn't know when he was going to come back. And the driver of that truck had a hundred thousand dollars worth of liability that was spent. Just the ER trip and the first surgery exhausted that driver's insurance policy. Sure. So after that, it's civil. He is responsible still for making this guy whole. And if the surgeon is making a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year, maybe he's making that a month. How do you compensate for that? That's where the umbrella comes in. Mm-hmm. It's designed to collect any overages if it would be in the car. On the home insurance, it's a little bit different. Home or most insurances deals with physical injury. An umbrella expands that to personal injury. Okay. So what I try to tell parents to think about is think about online activity. Cyberbullying is one of the biggest fears because it's out there and it can happen. It could be you and I share similar constraints within our industry of how much information we can share and how we can disseminate that information. Right. Sure. If somebody's fifth grade daughter is having a bad day and calls the math teacher a pervert on Facebook and she didn't really mean it, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it can all steamroll. So that umbrella is now designed to jump in and help. In a lot of cases, umbrella policies also pay for uh, the defense team. Uh So you're not out of pocket right away. And again, depending on the company, you always want to make sure you get an explanation. And that's got to be the caveat with all I'm saying. Everything that we're discussing is independent of any specific company. You have to know what what your company does. But yeah, the umbrella policies are, as you said at the beginning, are the cheapest way to preserve your wealth. And I try to tell people to use their equity, their net asset, their value. And the easiest thing, again, California is your home. It's mm-hmm. so easy to start out with a with being worth, yeah, you know, my net worth is 300,000. Two years later, the home market goes through the roof and all of a sudden your net worth is over 1.2 million. Sure. So you want your umbrella to go with you with your unprotected assets. Those are things that are in retirement accounts, Mm -hmm. your home equity, whatever your portfolio or your savings might be. And the 
best candidates, the most important candidates for an umbrella are elderly drivers who oh. are usually at higher risk, ones that have a home, they're living at Social Security maybe, but they do have their their equity and their property. And teenage drivers, for obvious, I say for obvious reasons. reasons. I've seen, yeah, I, I've seen, <laughs> okay. I've seen adults drive worse than teenagers. So shame on me for saying that. But but teenage drivers are learning, and they have a track record of having more accidents. So parents are going to pay more for an umbrella with a teenage driver, but the chances of your teenage driver being involved in a auto accident that's going to be substantially higher than what you might be involved with is a lot more. So. The umbrella is well worth buying. Yeah, it is. I like to tell people it's kind of that policy that picks up where the other ones let off. Because Absolutely. a lot of the times the liabilities, like you said, with that surgeon, my car insurance wouldn't cover that liability. And so, yeah, that umbrella would be critical. Yeah, absolutely. And and they're so inexpensive. I mean, a million dollar umbrella policies can start at $140 a year. And here's the other thing that a lot of people don't, don't realize. When you buy the umbrella, most companies provide you a discount on your auto and on your home. So I've seen umbrella policies be a net expense to the homeowner of maybe 50 to $100 a year. Mm-hmm. So wow. when, you, when you start processing it that way with the benefits it gives you and what the it's, yeah, know, it becomes a no brainer. dollars of coverage for that is crazy yeah. not to. Yeah. yeah. We have had a really good conversation and and you are just, I think as an insurance adjuster, as an agent, you've just been an absolute gem and so involved, I think too, in the educating of my clients and my students. I can't thank you enough. And so Vladin, if you had just one little pearl of wisdom before we all go, insurance is tough. What would you tell us? When you look at your insurance policies and no matter what company you're with, you're going to get just brochures, 14, 20 pages. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a pain. Take the time to skim it over, if nothing else. But if you're going to read anything on your policy, read what is excluded. Oh, okay. Exclusions will tell you the story more than anything. And there used to be an old axiom, what's not excluded is by default included. I don't know if that argument can be still made in today's world, But it's a good start because if you see whatever question you have is already answered as an exclusion, Mm -hmm. that may not be the right policy for you. Mm -hmm. Start investigating. So that's one. Secondly, is ask questions. Talk to your agent. Talk to the insurance representative. Know the specific answer to your specific question. You write it down. Document who you spoke to. And have that at Mm -hmm. your disposal should the issue ever arise. I can't stress that enough. The answers are out there. There's no reason anything should be a surprise when it hits. Is my sun covered? Is the uh, dog bite covered? Is the water leak under my sink covered? What happens if my, my renters damage my unit and they leave? All that is available prior to you writing that insurance check or hopefully not making that claim. But everything's there. You have been absolutely a blessing. And actually, now I got a bunch of questions for you. So I might be calling you (laughs) for a review. Anytime. We're going to put your link and your information into our podcast so people can reach out to you, ask questions, get a review. Um, Vlad, you have been a gem to me throughout the years. And today, thank you so much for your help and your knowledge and your sharing. Barbara, thank you. And you're doing a great job with this. I'm so glad to be a part of it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Advisory services are offered through Barbara J. Norman, LLC, an investment advisor in the states of California and Texas. The information contained herein should in no way be construed or interpreted as a solicitation to sell nor an offer to sell advisory services to any residents of any state other than the state of California or where otherwise legally permitted. All content is for information purposes only. It is not intended to provide any tax or legal advice or provide the basis for any financial decisions. The information contained in this material has been derived from sources believed to be reliable, but is not guaranteed as to accuracy and completeness and does not purport to be complete analysis of the materials discussed. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of SagePath Solutions and are subject to change without notice.